may be seated. May it please the court? Mr. Williams, Mr. McWilliams, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Your Honor, and hello, sir. Hi, uh, Your first name is Saad, correct? Correct. And would you pronounce your last name for me, please? Ma Mandui. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, just out of curiosity, what is your nationality? I'm from originally from Iraq. Okay, thank you very much. And your brother likewise? Correct. And you have a business, uh, there's a business. Uh, is he the owner of the business, a family business, or what over there in yes, Israel? Yes, it is his business. Okay, well thank you very much. Sure. Now, um, you've testified as carefully as you could today. Yes. Okay, and uh, this happened a while back, did it not? Correct. And um, we saw some of the situation which happened that you were personally there, isn't that correct? Correct. And you were very close to these people that uh, this was happening about and happening to you about, isn't that correct? Correct. Sir. Okay. And today uh, you looked at someone in the courtroom, correct? Correct. And I think you said that you are... Um, that the person who you identified looked familiar, isn't that correct? Correct. And would would you agree with me that you know the difference between something that's familiar and something that's positive? You know the difference, do you not? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And you did not say, and you did not mean to say that this was a, a positive identification of the, the person who this happened to when you said the person uh, in the courtroom was that person. Isn't that correct? Correct. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, how confident are you that the person who you identified here in court is the person you saw in that outdoor store? Well, f f when first time I came in, like, oh, of course I had, uh, I would say, not hundred, uh, not wasn't very very short but now after seeing the video after seeing the gentleman closely I'm 100% sure. I have nothing further. Thank you. Mr. McWilliams? Yes, um, when you say you're 100% uh, this statement that you first gave us um, you wanted to be truthful in the first instance did you not in your testimony before the jury today is that correct? Correct. And you were you did not say you were positive, did you? You or a hundred percent positive. You said that the person looks familiar. Isn't that correct? Yeah, but I don't want it to say hundred percent until I make sure that I'm I mean, it happened last year, but after seeing the gentleman closely and bring my memory my memory back, yes, I'm sure now hundred percent. Thank you. Anything from the jurors? Thank you, sir. You may be excused. Next Thank question. you. Uh, we go out of order to accommodate the schedule, if that's permissible. Yes. <coughs> yeah. so. May I inquire the witness, Your Honor? Please. Tell me your name, sir. Corporal Kai Sobel. Uh, Corporal Sobel, I see from your um, uniform that you are a uh, law enforcement officer. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Where do you currently work, sir? Uh, internal Affairs for the Wayne County Sheriff's Office. Uh, you're a Wayne County uh, Detective Sheriff? Yes. How long have you worked as a detective sheriff for Wayne County, sir? Um, for the last seven years. I've been with the department 20 years as a detective the last seven. What is your current assignment? Uh, internal Affairs. I monitor and record uh, all the telephones in the three Wayne County jails. And um, there's an inmate that's in custody in the Wayne County jail. Are, are there phone privileges afforded that inmate? Yes. How does that work? When you're booked into the Wayne County jail, you're booked chronolo in chronological order, so no two inmates have the same inmate number. Um, when they set up an account with a company called Securus, that's who we contract with. 
Um, they have to answer a couple questions, um, like say their name repeatedly, um, say United States. That's called voice biometrics. It's like a digital voice fingerprint uh, to recognize them. When they make a call, they have to punch in their inmate number followed by a four-digit PIN. What we usually do when they're booked in is we set the PIN to the last four of their social security number. However, not all inmates know the social security number, so we leave it at zeros. And when they set up the account, they set the PIN to a number they would remember, kind of like an ATM PIN. So uh, a PIN number is assigned to each inmate, correct? Well, it's the last four of the social security number if they know it. If not, we set it at zeros and they could set the PIN to a number they can remember. And are those pins recorded somewhere? Yeah, on a server that I have. Okay. And how do you monitor that? Well, I'm the only one that has access to it. Um, what I do is, I, I, in my office, I have two computers and a split screen, so I have uh, access to all three jail phone calls when the inmates are on the phone. Uh, their phone purposes are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And I can have a monitor for live monitoring, or if I wanted to pull an inmate's calls, I get a request, I match their date of birth into the IMS system, which we use as a jail system, along with the request and the secure us. So I, to make sure it's the right person, I have three uh, uh, ways of confirming that. I then put their name and their date of birth in the secure system with their inmate number and their name pops up. Okay. And is that the way you were able to track uh, individual inmates' phone calls, that way? I can do that or with the phone number. Okay, well, tell me how you can track an inmate's call based on a, tr a phone number. Well, first I'll put in their name and their date of birth, and then all calls that they've made, say, from January 1st to date, under their name will pop up. The numbers that they called, where they called from, how long they were on the call, to who even hung up the call. Um, and it'll tell you how long the call was and how it was paid for. Um, if there's a particular number that you want me to run, then you can ask me, and I can run a phone number through the system, and it'll tell me any inmate that's called that phone number in the Wayne County Jail system. So if, I, if uh, a law enforcement officer would give you a phone number, say 555-1212, uh, you could then put that in the system and determine whether, in fact, an inmate from the Wayne County Jail System had ever called that number. Correct. Would that tell you the date of the phone call? Yes, it would. Would it tell you the duration of the phone call? Yes. Would it tell you the inmate number or PIN number assigned to the inmate who made that phone call? Yes. Okay. And then you could you then print a report for that? Correct. How about the, the call itself? Is the call, all the calls from the inmates in the Wayne County Jail, are they monitored? Yes. Are they recorded? Yes. Um, when the, an inmate makes a phone call from the jail system, um, is there a voice uh, notification that the phone call is being monitored and or recorded? Yes. Um, and, and that's automatic, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So when someone calls out, uh, an inmate calls out from the Wayne County Jails, there's a voice that says that this call is subject to monitoring and recording. Fair enough? Yes. Okay. Um, in this case, um, I want to call your attention to uh, a phone call, uh, People's Proposed Exhibit Number 84, which occurred on June 19th, 2015. Uh, Corporal Sobel, uh, you were asked to pull some calls as it relates to the people of uh, the state of Michigan versus Kevin Smith, correct? Yes. And I want to direct your attention to a call in particular on June 19th, 2015, People's Proposed Exhibit Number 84. Um, is that a call that you were asked to uh, to um, record and then provide to us based on your monitoring of the defendant's phone calls? Um, I don't, unless I saw the printout. Okay. Do you have that? Okay. Do, do you have your printout there, uh, uh, um, Corporal Sobel? This is a different printout for just a different certain phone number. Okay. All right. We'll get, let's talk about that then. Um, <coughs> on. Um, May 2nd uh, of this year, um, were you asked to do an investigation as it relates to a, a particular phone number? Yes. And did um, Officer Burkott from the Detroit Police Department ask you to look for a specific phone number? Yes. And um, was that phone number found in your jail system? Yes. And uh, did you find any calls from an inmate to that specific phone number? Yes, I did. Okay. And how many calls? Um, the printout I printed this morning, I ran it from uh, March 1st to present day right now. Um, there were 108 calls. To that number you were asked for? Correct. And uh, were any of those 108 calls associated to the defendant, Kevin Smith's uh, PIN number or inmate number? Yes. 
uh, how many of the 106 calls that you told us about were associated with the defendant, Kevin Smith, the number or inmate PIN number? I have one. One. Okay. And what date is that? That's April 16th, 2016 at 20.04 p.m., which is 8.04 p.m. 8.04 p.m.? Yes. And what's the duration of that call? 42 seconds. Okay. Is that we a hang? by seconds. Okay. And was that a hang-up call, or what happened with that call? Um, the caller hung up. So the person that made the call from the jail hung up. Okay. So um, the person that made the call associated with the defendant Kevin Smith's phone number or PIN number hung up that phone call? Correct. Okay. Now, um, I want to draw your attention to uh, specifically the date of February 2nd. I'm sorry, February... Uh, February, uh, May 2nd of 2016. Was there a call associated to that particular number that you were asked to look at from Detective uh, Zaburkot? Yes. And is that the same phone number? Um, let, let's put the number on that record. What number is that, sir? 313-687-9121. And that's the number that the someone associated with the defendant's number called on April 16th of uh, 2016 for 42 seconds, correct? Correct. And that's a number that on May 2nd, 2016, another call was placed to, correct? Correct. Now, that call on May 2nd, 2016, was that a call from the defendant's PIN number or phone numbers or any number associated with him? No. Um, can you tell from your report, Corporal Sobel, whose number or PIN number that was assigned to that made that call on May 2nd? Daniel Frederick, but the call came from... The Ward 512. Okay. When you say Ward 512, what does that mean? Uh, the old jail, fifth floor, 512. Okay. And is there someone that you know that was on five, Ward 512? Yes. Who was? Kevin Smith and Daniel Frederick. Okay. Uh, back on May 2nd, Kevin Smith and Daniel Frederick were on Ward 512? Yes. Okay. And the call we're talking about, the one from May 2nd, came from? 512. 512. And whose inmate number was that assigned to? Uh, Daniel Frederick. Okay. So the defendant and Daniel Frederick are on the same ward on, on May 2nd, correct? Correct. The call to the number that uh, you were asked to look into uh, came from um, not, the, not the defendant, the other defendant, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and what's the duration of that call? That was a free one-minute call. All inmates get free one-minute calls when they enter, when they set up their account. Okay. Um, do you know, based on your records and review of the records kept by the Wayne County Jail, sir, uh, uh, Corporal Sobel, is there any um, evidence of an association between the def this defendant and the other defendant? Not to my knowledge. Okay. All right. Um, you know, at this time, people are going to move to admit People's Proposed Exhibit Number 77, which is the call from uh, May 2nd, uh, 2016. Your Honor, um, I think there will be some question or challenge as to the voices heard on this call and I am wondered if a better foundation could be laid as far as how, if at all, the authenticity and, and voice print of the, the actual caller that was calling can be laid. Voice print evidence <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, step into the jury room. I'll rise. Um, outside the presence of the jury, this is um, Corporal Sobel who was asked, uh, based on information received from the officer in charge, to run that number because the defendant was calling, uh, information that the officer received was that the defendant was calling trying to reach Robert Williams, a.k.a. Nunu's girlfriend, to talk to him prior to his testimony. And on the call, you're going to hear, although it comes from a different defendant, it comes from the same ward number where the defendant is assigned on, you're going to hear the defendant's voice. 
referring to Nunu's homie and asking questions as to why the cousin of uh, the girlfriend is allowing Nunu to testify and, and refers to him as a rat um, on, on uh, several, several occasions. Now, the other call, um, which also has the defendant's voice on it, we're getting the records right now just so uh, Corporal Sobel can authenticate that as well, but you can hear the same voice pattern. So the people um, are offering this um, as evidence of the defendant's consciousness of guilt, and once the, the call is heard, the jury can decide whether it's the same voice or not. Okay. My response is, Your Honor, initially the, the, the caller is asked to state it sounds like one or two <coughs> words. To me, that sounds like they're trying to document the voice print of the person who's actually calling. They, they have the person say, for example, United States. And when they do that, I assume that that then establishes in some fashion, some technical fashion, who in fact uh, the caller is. And thereafter, you hear other voices, and I'm wondering to, to establish <coughs> technically that it is in fact the voice of Mr. Um, Smith, whether or not the, the voice pattern or the the uh, technical analysis of his voice is matching the, the voices that, uh, uh, of the caller coming from the originating phone number in the jail to this person who picks up the phone at the other end of the call. Well, if I understand Mr. Moran's argument, perhaps I'm not, but if I understand his argument, I think he's saying that there is an earlier phone call made to an address phone number that is Robert Williams' girlfriend's phone, and that's attributable to Mr. Smith. That's sometime earlier. That's correct. That's in uh, April. Then, then in May, there is another phone call placed by someone other than a Mr. Smith to the same girlfriend of Robert Williams at the same number that Mr. William or Mr. Smith allegedly called. And if I'm interpreting the prosecutor's theory correctly, is that they're saying that Mr. Frederick makes the phone call and presumably then gives the phone to Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith is the one who is on the phone speaking. Correct. That's the people's theory? Yeah, it is. And we have taken this witness out of order, but I assume that there is going to be some other witness that the people are going to put on the stand and will say that they have heard he, they've talked with Mr. Smith or they know Mr. Smith's voice from Correct. speaking with him in the past and can recognize his voice and will identify both as saying that this is his voice? Yes, Sounds and not like his voice. Yes, and not only that, Your Honor, um, the officer in charge is going to testify that he identifies his voice on this call as being belonging to the defendant. But he's also going to testify that the defendant's own conduct while in the Wayne County Jail, um, allowing other inmates to use his PIN number to call um, people that are not on their contact list. So it's a, it's a process where inmates okay. want to reach out to someone other than and not be recorded. I understand. I, I do think, uh, Mr. McWilliams, I'll note your objection, but in light of the fact that we've taken this witness out of order and that there are going to be, there is going to be an additional witness called to identify uh, the voice uh, of uh, Mr. Smith, uh, I do think uh, it's admissible. It goes to uh, the weight rather than its admissibility. Uh, circumstantial evidence. I'll allow it. Thank you very much for the analysis. All right. Yes, All rise. Yes, please take your
please. This time, Your Honor, I would move to admit People's Proposal Exhibit Number 84, which is the jail call of uh, May 2nd, 2016. Which number now, please? Uh, this is 77. Is that correct? 77, which is May 2nd of 2016. So, uh, the colloquy, Your Honor. Uh, all right. <coughs> Objection is noted. Can you receive? Thank you. Person to publish, Your Honor? Yes. Go ahead. <coughs> After the beep, please check. After the beep, please check. <coughs> United States. Thank you. There's no available talk line for this call. Okay. Thirty minutes. Additional call party restrictions may apply. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. You may hear silence during the acceptance of your call. Please continue to hold. Hello. Please hold while we attempt to connect your call. Your called party will be given the opportunity to open an account to pay for future calls for you. We will now attempt to connect you for a short free call. After the free call, your call party will be offered payment options to set up an account to pay for future calls. Your call party will be given the opportunity to open an account to pay for future calls from you. Telecommunication services provided by Securus Technologies. For more information on products and services, visit www.securustech.net. Calls are subject to recording and may be monitored. You may start your conversation now. Hello. Hello. What are they? Brand new on? Who is this? There's no new homeboy. New new homeboy who? Hey, hey, bro, you just call my phone. Get the fuck out. You tell them to stop giving you everybody fucking number, bitch. If you want to die, bitch, you're going to be next on the list, nigga. Stop fucking calling around, bitch. My cousin's straight, ho. Niggas be real tough on the phone, man. You nigga, fuck you, can whoever, bitch. Remember, you got people that are here too with your whole ass. Get the fuck yeah, on, bitch. You ain't about that life, nigga. That's why your bitch ass in there where you at now. Get the fuck on. Yeah. No, no, you right be ass. careful, bitch. No more no, right red-ass bitch. Whatever, bitch. Yo, sisters, you got family out here too, you dumb motherfucker. Man, whatever, man. With your bum ass. Nigga, you ain't hard either, bitch. I ain't about to argue with you. All right, it's, it's, it's cool, bruh. Whatever, nigga. You ain't tough. Whatever. Tell him I know. We know where these people at. He's no way. Hey, hey, fuck you and whoever else got something to say about it, bitch. Nah, find them, bitch. If you want, if you want them that bad, bitch, find them. Nah, bitch. Niggas be tough on the phone, dog. Hey, fuck you, nigga. Ask Kevin why I'm at, bitch. Hey, Kevin will tell you, bitch. Come, come out at me, nigga. You and you in the call, you bitch. So you coming home? What? So nigga, tell that nigga tell you where I'm at. He know where I'm at, nigga. Come out at me. Man, you ain't hard, man. Bitch, I, hey, I ain't got to be hard, bro. But when they made guns, they ain't stop making them, bro. I still can take your face, you dumbass nigga. That's a lot of threat. A lot of threat on the recorded phone call. Why you ain't your parents I'm sorry, your called party has discon... I'm sorry, your called party has... Corporal Solo, is that the extent of, of the phone conversation uh, back on May 2nd between... Um, the inmate and the number you identified is 313-687-9121? Yes. Now, um, if you can walk me through that a little bit, I, I know that I heard some in, in the initial conversations um, that sound like a reported voice. Can you explain that to the jury, what that is? When, they, when a, a phone account is set up, they're um, asked a bunch of questions to start the voice biometrics. Um, that wasn't Daniel Frederick's voice because I listen to Daniel Frederick's voice every day. Okay, so in your capacity as um, an, an investigator with the uh, Sheriff's Department, a corporal with internal affairs, you, you listened to Mr. Frederick's voice? 
Yes, I have him on what's called a covert alert. I spe special de uh, detailed attention to his calls. I monitor him daily and have been. And, and can you tell me why that is, why you would have a special monitoring for an, a single individual defendant? Sometimes if they're suicidal or I suspect they're trying to smuggle drugs or contraband into the jail, I kind of pay close attention to them, so to speak. But I don't understand, Corporal. Can you explain to me how it is that you said it's not Mr. Frederick, right? Correct. But that's his number, right? Yep. How does that work? Because what they do is they steal it. What do you mean they? Inmates steal other inmates' PIN numbers and set up the voice metrics. So if, say, Mr. Frederick didn't set up his account yet, they can get a hold of his PIN number or his inmate number, which is on his wristband, and if it's all set at zeros, meaning he didn't set up his account and change it yet, any inmate can open an account under that person's name and then set the voice biometrics to their voice. Now, is it also, has it ever occurred in your experience of working as a detective in the in Internal Affairs Department, the Wayne County Jail, that sometimes inmates will, will share numbers? Absolutely. And do you know why that is? They trade numbers for commissary, which is a food cart that comes around. They trade numbers for food trays. They trade numbers for a bunch of things and phone calls. And why is it so that someone would trade a number for a phone call? Because they don't want to be recognized. In your experience, have you ever been asked to track um, phone numbers that are not associated with another defendant based on <coughs> their inmate number? Do you know what I'm saying? All the time. What, can you explain to the jury why it is you do that? Well, I do that because what happens is inmates will make phone calls under their name, and then there's certain phone calls that they don't want made under their name, so they'll... Uh, like this case where if the both both inmates are on the same ward, which is 512, you can use another inmate's PIN even if you didn't set up an account. What happens is the inmate will answer the questions and say their name, say United States, and then they'll hand the phone or to the inmate and he can dial the number and make the call under that person's name. And, and that's uh, when an inmate is trying to make a call that you don't want associated with them? Correct. And you're positive that's not Mr. Frederick's voice? 100% sure. Okay. Um, the other call conversation I wanted to direct you to um, occurs um, on what's the number? Occurs on June 19th of 2015. Um, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Mr. Williams, this is 521. Thank you. For my soul, I'm handing you what's marked as people as number 521. That, sir, if you would. <coughs> Um, I'm going to, um, this has been marked as People's Supposed Exhibit Number 84, and with the court's permission, I'm going to play the first portion of it, the voice metrics, so that the uh, witness can authenticate it. Which, which is 521? 521 is a printout log that's associated with the defendant, Kevin Smith's phone call. Is that correct, Corporal Sobel? Yes. Okay. And that's used for identification purposes to identify uh, his PIN number, phone numbers, that sort of thing, correct? Correct. Okay. And if I play a portion of a reporting from um, that date, specifically the date of um, June 19th, 2015, would you be able to identify the first part based on the metrics? Yes. Okay. With the court's permission, Your Honor? Same objection, uh, yes, Mr. Right. McWilliams, and um, your objection is preserved. I'll, uh, I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead, 84. We'll Thank you. <coughs> After the beep, please say United States. United States. After the beep, please say United States. United States. Thank you. Your total available talk time for this call is 20 minutes. Additional call party restrictions may apply. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. You have your silence during the acceptance of your call. Please continue to hold. <coughs> Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from an inmate at Wayne County, Division 3. This call is subject to reporting and monitoring. To accept charges, press 1. To refuse charges, press 2. If you thank you for using Securus, you may start a conversation now. Hello? Yes. Yeah, you're looking out for me. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Why am I fucking name on the picture here? 
Can you turn that up? Yes. Oh. Um, Sobel, um, I want to draw your attention to the first part of that call. Um, when the caller is asked to say United States twice, is that correct? Correct. Is that part of the, bio, the voice metrics that we're talking about? Yes. Okay. And then there's also a response um, indicating how much time is left or available talk time is available to the inmate. Is that correct? Correct. Can you explain that to the jury what that means? Well, what they do is because they, they have money in the account, whether they buy it off a commissary cart that comes around or people put money on their phone or they make collect calls. And usually when they, ha they use the debit off the commissary, or they have, we have kiosks in all the jails, people can come put money on the phone. It gives them account balance and tells them how much time they have left. And then there's an indication that, um, I heard someone say this is Kev or Kev, what is that? They have to say their name before the they can talk. Have to, go ahead, I didn't want to cut you off. If they don't, they have to say their name, it's voice biometric. If it doesn't recognize it, they will not let a call go through. Okay, and um, we all heard this is Kev or the word Kev, is that correct? Correct. Okay, based on that, is this a call that we asked you to produce? Uh, as it relates to the defendant, Kevin Smith? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you play People's Exhibit number 84? Um, Your Honor, just for the record, this is these are clips from that call, not the entire call. All right. Okay, well, no. Not, not any problem down here. I know it's got to be for that round. <laughs> That's a portion of the call, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. That's all I have, Your Honor. Mr. McWilliams. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. You're the hidden person behind the, at the jail that's listening to the phone calls and documenting what's happening, coming and going of the outside, inside to persons um, on the phones. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You come and testify often in these kind of cases or any kind of cases? Frequently, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, it, it, are you in the technical business? Is this strictly technical where you're at? I'm the only one that does it in the county. Okay. And how many people in the jail would you be <coughs> monitoring as far as phone calls uh, at any one time, generally? That differs daily. And today or on the date, on, uh, on these dates in question, how many approximately? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. What do you, when I'm live monitoring, and when, when okay. I'm in my office? All right. That can vary between the jails. There could be two people on the phone at Dickerson. There could be ten people at Division Two. There's no set number. Okay. Well, when a person comes in, they're they're given the availability of phone privileges. Isn't that correct? Yes. And we're talking about a lot of people in both the jails. Isn't that correct? Correct. Okay. Not just two or three. Correct. Correct. Well, we're talking about hundreds, aren't we? Yes. Okay, good. That's what I was getting at. Now, this business about um, about voice metrics, is that what we're talking about is a voice print or a voice analysis? Correct. Okay. And are you looking um, on a on a on a uh, oscilloscope or something like that for a pattern of voice and, and is that what you do? It's part of the Securus package. Okay. It comes with the system that we use. Okay. And so the system is analyzing the voice and telling you information. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. It's not you looking at a screen to see whether or not you see wavelengths and then comparison them, comparing them to, to the voice patterns of different people? No, I don't do that. Okay. It's the system. It's a computer system. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thanks. And are you familiar with that system, and did you have training on that system as to the reliability? Yes, I did. And uh, tell us about the reliability. Well, I've never had a problem with the system. I started using it December 18th of 2013. Okay. And so no one has ever challenged or there has been no error rate shown in 
the identification by this voice metric system to identify the person who says their name. Is that correct? As far as I know. Okay. Well, when a person says Kev, okay, is that the word or voice that is then analyzed and preserved for purposes of voice metric identification? No, United States is used. United States, okay. The person that says their name Kev is only for the purpose of the person who's receiving the call so they know who it's coming from? Correct. Okay, I get it. So that they don't have to answer it. They don't. Correct. Okay, all right. And it is the word United States of America so characteristic that it can be used for global identification for jail purposes within the jail? I have no idea. You have no idea, okay. But that's the common term, United States, is that correct? That's what Secura sets up. Okay. And if they don't say it right or it's not the print, then that number, that call cannot be placed? Correct. Okay. And it just goes blank or cuts it off? And hangs up. Hangs up and essentially lets the person know that's calling from the jail outward, essentially you're not using the right credentials or PIN number. Is no. That, is it tells that? them this call cannot be completed and hangs up. Okay. The end. Correct. Okay. And now, uh, is there anything that you've told us today with regard to the your analysis and opinion that is only your opinion based upon what you've heard as to who was calling it's my opinion that that was not Daniel Frederick okay and that's whose pin number name was given correct okay and the outgoing caller identification in your estimation was someone other than who you've just named but you don't know for sure that it was Kevin Smith. Isn't that correct? Correct. Thank you. All you can tell us is that you know based on your job that that's not Mr. Frederick on that call. Correct. And Mr. Frederick and the defendant Kevin Smith were on the same ward together when that call was placed, right? Yes, they were. Thank you. Just one additional. How many people are also on that ward? There's 10 on a ward if it's full. I don't know how many were on it that day. Thank you very much. Any questions? All right. Uh, thank you very much. You may be excused, sir. Thank you. Would you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, yeah. Please have a seat and adjust the microphone in front of you if you would, please. May I inquire the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Tell me your name, please. Jessica Huber. Uh, Ms. Huber, are you employed? Yes. What do you do? I'm a police officer with the City of Detroit. How long have you been a police officer, Officer Huber? Two years. And um, what is your current assignment? 8th uh, Precinct on patrol. Uh, you're a patrol officer for the 8th Precinct, correct? Yes. What area encompasses the 8th Precinct of the City of Detroit, Officer? Uh, it's the Northwest District, so Telegraph to Greenfield and Schoolcraft up to 8 Mile. Okay. I'm going to take you back in time, if I can, to February 21st of 2015. Uh, at around 9.24 p.m. on February 21st, 2015, were you working and on duty as a Detroit police officer with uh, the City of Detroit? Yes. And we, at that time, what was your assignment? I was Scout 812. Okay, 812. Is that part of the 8th Precinct as well? Yes. So tell the jury what 812 means. Uh, we are 
8th precinct. That's the 8, and 12 is the car that we are. When you say we, is there someone else in the car, 812, with you besides yourself? Yes, my partner, Joseph Walker. You and Officer Walker were assigned to 812? Yes. And were you working on duty at about 920 in the evening back on that February date in 2015? Yes. Uh, working routine patrol, fair to say? Yes. Okay. Um, during your um, shift, did you have occasion to get a, a run to go to an address on Long Acre in the city of Detroit? Yes. Okay. And it, just for the record, is that 13995 Long Acre, Long Acre Street in the city of Detroit? Yes, sir. And is that also in the 8th Precinct, Long Acre? I believe it's just south. Okay. W do you know which precinct that would be? Six. Six precinct. So the even number of precincts are on the west side and the odd numbers are on the east side, correct? Yes. Okay. So what was the nature of the police run to that address on Long Acre Street in the city of Detroit? Originally it was a RA in progress with a gun. Okay. Now, did, was the RA, was it committed on Long Acre Street, if you know? It was not. Okay. Did you go to Long Acre Street? Yes. And when you got to Long Acre Street, did you encounter an individual by the name of Hazel Stewart? I did not encounter Hazel. I talked to her daughter. Okay. And what is her daughter's name? Chelsea. Uh, I'm sorry? Chelsea. Chelsea Stewart? Yes. And what is the age of Chelsea Stewart? Uh, she was 45 at the time. And what was the age of Hazel Stewart? Hazel was 70. Okay. And was information supplied to you about an armed robbery at another location? Yes. Okay. And what was the address of the armed robbery location? Uh, 14364 Mansfield. And that in the city of, De of Detroit? Yes. Okay. And that involved the 70-year-old Hazel Stewart, the armed robbery? Yes. Okay. Now, why in the world would you go to Longacre to take a report on a uh, robbery that took place on Mansfield? We had been uh, called to Longacre, and we talked to the victim's daughter, Chelsea, who said that her mother had been robbed on Mansfield and had called her. And did the, uh, okay, so Hazel Stewart called uh, Kelsey Stewart? Chelsea. Chelsea Stewart. Um, and conveyed some information to her daughter? Yes. Okay. You went to Long Acre and talked to the daughter? Yes. Okay. Did you ever talk to Hazel Stewart as a result of your conversation with Chelsea? We did later on. Um, the victim, Hazel, had left Mansfield after she had been robbed and she fled to another family member's house because she was scared. Okay. So she calls her daughter who lives on Long Acre, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Um, conveys information to her, correct? Yes. Now, did Chelsea Stewart tell you that she talked to her mother, Hazel? Yes. And her mother's a 70-year-old uh, female, correct? Yes. And during the course of that conversation, I, I assume, and don't tell us what she said, but Chelsea Stewart conveyed information that she got from her mother, correct? Yes. Based on that, did, did Chelsea tell you that her mother was upset? And uh, so upset that she fled her home, right? Yes. And went to some other location? Correct. Okay. And you took in for, did you take information from Chelsea Stewart that was conveyed to you by her daughter? By her mother? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, I misspoke. Let, let me ask you again. Did you take information from Chelsea Stewart that was conveyed by Hazel Stewart? Yes. Okay. And did that information relate to the circumstances about the robbery? Yes. The location, that sort of thing? Uh, individuals involved, that sort of thing, correct? Yes, and then when Hazel was brought back to Mansfield, I also spoke with Hazel and yeah. got the information from her. Okay. You're one step ahead of me. Sorry. Um, after you talked to Chelsea, did you go somewhere else? We went to Mansfield. Okay. And when you got to Mansfield, was anyone there at that time? Her, the victim's son was there, and he ended up bringing Hazel back to Mansfield. Do you recall the victim's son's name? Um, Gary. Gary Stewart. Okay. So you get the location. Gary Stewart is there already? Yes. On Mansfield? Yes. Right. What's the address on Mansfield? It was 14364 Mansfield. Um, at some point after you got to Mansfield, you and your partner go there, right? Yes. At some point when you and your partner got there, Hazel Stewart is brought back. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now... Is that the first time that you've actually had contact with Hazel Stewart back in February 2015? Yes. Ever met her before in life? No. Okay. D describe her for us, please. Um, she was, like I said, a black female in her 70s. Um, she was very shaken when I met her at that point. Okay. She was still upset? Yes. Did it appear to you that she's still suffering from 
uh, the emotion of uh, under the situation of being robbed in her own home. Yes. Okay. Um, she left her home and comes back to her home, right? Correct. You, you take information from her? Yes. Was the nature of the information that it relate to the armed robbery itself? Yes. Did she give you information about the description of people that were involved in the robbery? From what she could, yes. Okay. When you say from what she could, what do you mean by that? She told my partner and I that... Your Honor, uh, for the record, I need to voice an objection. I know that there may be some leeway here if there was, in fact, uh, an excited utterance. What I would like to do is know what the time frame was between the time of the alleged event at uh, Mansfield and the time that she came back uh, so that I would know what the disparity in time was for the purpose of judging the, the length of time as to the, uh, the likelihood of uh, the uh, true excited utterance. I, I can ask. Go ahead. Do, do you, uh, um, officer, um, uh, do you know how much time passed between Ms. Stewart being robbed in her home and then you and she meeting up back on Mansfield when, she, the, when her son brought her back over? It's approximately 35, 40 minutes. Okay. So less than an hour? Yes. Okay. And you told you were, you were in the process of describing how it appeared, uh, from, you, from your perspective at least, that she was still under the strand of being robbed, right? Yes. Um, can you tell us what you mean by that? She was visibly shaken. Uh, she was she was crying. She was very upset. Um, and less than an hour had gone by, and, and you were describing to us as best as she could. She was trying to give you some information about the persons involved in the robbery, correct? Yes. What type of information did she convey to you? She told me that it was three black males with ski masks, and they were all armed with handguns. Did she indicate if anything was taken from her? Okay. Yes. What, what types of things were taken from her? She had said um, an unknown amount of jewelry, a 32-inch Vizio flat-screen TV, and a debit card. Did you do anything with that information that you got from Ms. Stewart? Yes. I, I relayed it um, over the air, and I put it in my, um, my Krisnet. What, what is a Krisnet, officer? It's a uh, report. And, in fact, you're holding something in your hand there, is that right? Yes. What, what are you holding in your hand? This is my Krisnet report. Okay. And is that a report that you that you prepared sometime around the events that you've described for the jury today? Yes. Okay. So, basically the only information you were able to get out of Mr. S Ms. Stewart was that she was robbing her home, three men with ski masks and guns, right? Correct. So, a jewelry, a, te a Vizio television, and then a debit card? Yes. Okay. Was taken from her, is that right? Correct. Okay. And you prepared a report, and what else did you do? Um, I advised my supervisor, and they ordered evidence text to the scene. Okay. And um, you're not an evidence technician, are you, officer? No, sir. Okay. Did you collect any evidence there that day? I did not. Okay. Would you recognize the, uh, the address on Mansfield if you were a seat again? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Officer, I'm going to hand you mark to the people's proposals. I'm sorry, Mr. McLean. 202? That's quite okay. Thank you. <coughs> people's proposals of number 202. Do you recognize what that is? Yes. Is that a photograph? Yes. Is that a house? Is that a photograph of Ms. Stewart's house on Mansfield? Yes. Move to admit 202, Your Honor. Without objection. It'll be received. Just uh, so we can see on the monitor, um, Officer, that, that's the house we're talking about, that Ms. Stewart was, uh, yes. was her home back in February of 2015, correct? Correct. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. No questions. Any questions by the jurors? Officer, thanks very much. You may be excused. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you tell us your name? Uh, Demir Jakubovic. 
Keep your voice up. Sure. Thank you. And how are you employed? Floyd? A Detroit Police Department. How long have you been a Detroit Police Officer? Six years. Where were you assigned or what were your duties uh, back on February 21st of 2015? Eight Precinct Detective Unit. And are, do you have any special duties with regard to your assignment? Yes, at that time I was uh, pulling videos. And what is pulling videos? Extracting data from DVRs and uh, computers, video data. And what do you do with the data that you receive? I place it on a flash drive or a CD, and I make it viewable for whoever's requesting the video. Okay. And were you involved in the investigation of an incident that had occurred at 14364 Mansfield in the city of Detroit? Yes. And what was your role in the investigation? I got a video request extraction from investigator Moses to make two locations to extract video. And the two locations that you were requested to extract video from, were you given a time period that you were to focus on? Yes. And what was that time period, if you recall? May I reference my report? Will that help you refresh your memory as to the time? Yes. Then please do so. The first location I made was 1901 East 7 Mile Road. It was a Sunoco gas station and the times extracted were 2024 20, hours to 2033 20, hours. The second location I made was 13325 Liver Noise. It's DNL liquor store and the hours extracted were 1956 to 2005 and both were on uh, February 21st of 2015. Now, I'm not someone that's great at doing military time. Can okay. you convert that into just standard time? Sure. The first location on 7 Mile is 824 to 833 p.m. And the second location is um, 756 to 805 p.m. And did you go to those locations? Yes. Okay. And I want to start with the location of 13325 Livernois in the city of Detroit. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Judge, at this time I have spoken to defense counsel um, regarding people's proposed exhibits number 519. 420 and 204. I've, I've seen them, Your Honor, acknowledged, and uh, as long as they will be demonstrated and authenticated by this witness, uh, they will be without objection. All right? Thank you. I'd move for admission at this time. Go ahead. Thank you. They'll be received. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. Now, officer, I'm handing you three uh, exhibits that have been previously admitted. I'm going to put them in the order that we're going to go over them, okay? Okay. Let's be careful. There's a right there. Uh, let's start with the first one that you have in your hand. Uh, People's Exhibit number 420. I'm going to put that up on the screen back there. What is that a photograph of? It's a photograph of DNL Liquor Store. And that's what's behind you on that screen? That's correct. And that's the location that you were requested to go to to extract some video, correct? Correct. Now I'm also going to, uh, you have another item in your hand, is that correct? Yes. Is that a DVD? Yes. And is that marked as People's Exhibit number 200, 204? Yes. Now is that the video that you extracted for this uh, event? Yes. At 13325 Livernoy? Yes. Judge, at this time I'd like permission to play clips from that. Motion granted. Thank you. Now, Officer Jakubovic, I'm going to direct your attention to back there, and I'm going to play for you camera angle 17, a clip of that. Okay. okay? Now I'm going to stop this first. Is that the inside of that store that you had gone to? Yes, it's by the front entrance. And were you directed to focus on any particular area within the store? Yes, the ATM. 
And you see the ATM there? Yes. To the left, uh, kind of left center of the screen? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to continue playing the clip. And now I'm going to, I apologize, I'm going to stop it again. Do you see a time and a date stamp up there? I do. It's February 21st, 2015, 9.50, I'm sorry, uh, 7.59 p.m. and 54 seconds. And now we've heard some other uh, testimony from some other officers um, that have extracted some video, and we've learned about something called a time differential. Do you know Correct. what that is? Yes. Was there any type of a time differential here at uh, 13325 Livernoy? I believe there was. Uh, do you recall what that was? If I may reference my report. Please do so if that will refresh your memory. At this particular location, it was 3 minutes and 52 seconds ahead of actual time. So that's fast, what we're looking at. Correct. Okay. So the time adjustment would be? It would be minus by 3 minutes and 52 seconds from okay. this. Thank you. I'm going to continue playing this clip. Now, was that taken from that time period that you were told to focus on? Correct. Okay. Now, I'm going to direct your attention to what's camera angle 18. Is that that same camera view? This is camera number 9. And do you see a time stamp on that video? Yes. What's it the time stamp and date on there? It's the 21st of February 2015 and it's 8 and 33 seconds. 8 o'clock p.m.? Yes. With the three minutes fast? Yes. Now you also have some photographs there as well, correct? Yes. Are those what we call still photographs? Correct. Okay. And are those photographs that you would have captured um, with regards to this incident? Yes. Now I believe you have one in your hand? Yes. People's Exhibit 519, correct? Correct. And that appears to be a still of the surveillance video that you would have uh, extracted, correct? Correct. With an unreadable timestamp, but for, from camera nine. Uh, this is actually from a different location. Oh. This is from the gas station. I apologize. Not what's up on the screen, what you have there in your hand, correct? Uh, that is not what I have in my hand. That is, what you have on the screen, 519, is not what you have in your no. hand? No. Okay. Now you also went to a second location, correct? Correct. And is that location 1901 East 7 Mile? Yes. And what type of a location is that, if you recall? It's a gas station. Very good. Any objection? No. Okay. 
Judge, at this time I'd move to admit People's Proposed Exhibit 206 and 212, which we will be showing. Thank you. No. 206 and 212 will be received. <coughs> now, Officer Jack Jakubovic, I'm going to switch and take what you have there and give you some other stuff. Sure. Okay. I've handed you two exhibits. I'll start with the disc. Now, from 1901 East 7 Mile, you extracted video from there as well, correct? Correct. And that was with regard to this incident that you had um, been assigned out to? Correct. Okay. And did you actually do that? Yes. And was there some sort of a time differential at this location? Yes. Do you recall what that was? It was... Referring to your report? Yes. Okay. It was approximately one hour and five minutes ahead of actual time. So what we're going to view in just a moment is an hour and how long? And five minutes. Fast. Fast. And what it shows on the, the time stamp. Correct. What okay. it shows on the time stamp, so we would have we would minus an hour. So it's actually on the, on the photo that you gave me, it says 9.29 p.m. We're looking at uh, 8. 24 p.m. in actual time. 8.24 p.m. in actual time. Yes. And you're referring to People's Exhibit number 212 is what you're referring to. Yes. Okay. Which is a still photo of a video that you've extracted? Correct. Okay. Now I'm going to play that video for you, clips from that video. Is that the store that you had gone to up in uh, People's Exhibit number 206? Yes, the gas station. Were you extracted video? Correct. Do you see a time or date stamp on there? I do. February 21st, 2015, 9.29 p.m. So in the actual time, what is that, if you, if you know? It would be 8.24 p.m. Thank you. And were you again told to focus on the ATM area? Correct. I showed you some clips from some um, video that you've extracted, correct? Correct. But the what you actually extracted were longer versions of these. Yes. With more camera angles than we've shown here today. Yes. And those are contained on the discs that you have there in front of you. 204 and people's 206? Yes. Okay. I have no other questions. Sir McWilliams. Yes, very briefly. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, you um, have an expertise in what it is that y you showed us and what your result is here? Yes, I'm trained to extract video footage data from a DVR or a computer. And who trained you? FLETC in Georgia. It's a federal it's a federal government down in Georgia. It's FLETC. Okay. FLETC. What is that? FLETC. Are you with 
uh, uh, Sergeant Ron Gibbons, uh, Ron Gibbons' team? Gibson's Gibson? team? Gibson? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. But do you do? Do you understand? You do the same thing he does. He did or yes, does? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you have credentials to, that for this. Is that correct? <coughs> yes, I have credentials to extract video footage data. Okay. Thank you. Can you tell us uh, in those two clips with the red hoodie? You saw a person in there with the red hoodie and that kind of stuff, right? Yes. You can't tell us who that was, can you? I cannot. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing else. Anything? Thank you, Detective. You can step down, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to send you to lunch at, at this time. I'm going to ask that you be back at uh, 135. That's an hour and 10 minutes from now. Leave your notebooks on your chair. Have a nice lunch. We'll see you back here at 135. All rise.